Oh, welcome to Sfera Talks. Our guests are interesting people who live among us. And today our guest is Gregory Ward, the teacher, teacher of English in Turku International School. Hello, Greg. Hello, Sergei. Nice to meet you here. Uh, absolutely the same. Delighted. So, tell about yourself. Okay, uh, well, a little bit. I was born in Jersey in 1964, which is a long time ago. Uh, my mum was a, a midwife, and so she had plenty of experience of young children. Um, and then I had a, a brother born 18 months after me. My father was an uh, electronic broadcast engineer who'd moved over to Jersey with his job and had met my mum, and they met and married fairly quickly. And then I came along, then my brother. I grew up a fairly ordinary life as a schoolboy, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. When was it when you didn't know? When I, when I left school, I oh. drifted into banking, which was banking. basically, well, that's what Jersey is. It's a floating bank. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I didn't really have any idea what to do. And then... How old were you? I was 18, 18? 18, 19. Uh -huh. So I'd just done my sort of equivalent to white cap, the A-levels. And I was there for about 18 months and I really detested it. My friends, most of them had gone to university, some were also working in banks. And then uh, one night what, had a... If, if, if you tell, why, what exactly did you, did you not like in this thing? Well, I just realized it was basically unethical, really. I mean, it was just basically making lots of money, shifting money around and lots of little things. I just thought, I don't feel comfortable doing this. I couldn't do it myself and I thought I'm making a lot of rich people richer. Uh, and I just thought, no, I, I don't belong here. This is not my thing. I don't think my boss was too happy when I stuck up a Lenin poster on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> you mean Vladimir Lenin? Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, he wasn't too happy about that, but I mean, I guess it was just, it was a shock. I'd been at school very comfortable. Mm. I enjoyed being at school and all of a sudden actually working to earn money. It wasn't for me. I had a small brush with the law, uh -huh. which got my dad thinking and he said, you're not happy, are you? And I said, nope, I'm not. And he said, well, my friend... And that brush was... I'm not going to go okay, into that. Okay, okay, okay. I can tell you when I've retired. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> it's nothing too bad. I mean, the school do know about it, but uh, uh -huh. it was just a, a slightly embarrassing incident. Anyway, the, the thing was that he said, you're not happy. And I said, no. Nope. He said, we can, we've been thinking. Uh, my friend, I mean, she, she's a school teacher, said, how about becoming a teacher? You, you like doing lots of different things. Uh, I said, okay, I'll think about it. I applied to a training college in London called Strawberry Hill. Strawberry Hill. Yeah. Fantastic thing. Well, it's, it's a fantastic place. It, it's based, it's a Gothic house uh -huh. built by the Earl of Walpole or something like that. He was Britain's first unofficial prime minister uh -huh. in the 18th century. It's a Gothic reconstruction thing and it, it was pretty impressive and I wanted to go there. And I spent four years training to be a teacher there before mm -hmm. being let loose. Mm -hmm. uh, well, actually I had another, you know, I had to wait another year because in that time it also injured my neck badly and had to have a cervical fusion operation which put me out of action for a bit of time and then I started teaching properly a year after I qualified. Mm -hmm. I was lucky, I got a nice break in a, a school, uh, a little school near the airport at Jersey. And although I wanted to teach older children, I was given year three, which was seven and eight year olds. Yeah. I immediately got to like them. And, uh, and I was- you were teaching English. I, I was teaching. I was teaching in a Jersey school, and I was teaching very much like here. I teach most subjects, except I wasn't obviously teaching Finnish, and, <laughs> and uh, I did well lots of things: English, maths, um, PE, art, um, handwriting. I used to teach handwriting once a week, which was interesting because that's kind of almost disappeared. Um, and then I was there for two years. Mm -hmm. And then my contract ran out and I then went to a, a church school for 11 years, which I really enjoyed as well. It was actually the school I went to when I was very young. Mm -hmm. And one of my old teachers was still there, so it was kind of strange working with her. And then the situation changed in 
2002, we had a big school inspection, mm -hmm. which took two years build up. And at the same time, my brother was ill with cancer. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of stress. I was trying to get ready for the school inspection and at the same time be with my brother as much as possible. And the, the event happened, the inspection happened in January. It went very well. And then unfortunately, three weeks later, my brother started stopping treatment. And then he sadly passed away on May the 9th, 2002. We had a new principal or head teacher arriving and that was not good news for me. I didn't get on with her mm -hmm. and I kind Why? of... What was that? Well, she kind of thought she knew everything and also she wanted everybody to be teaching all the subjects and we couldn't like swap each other's around. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if, if somebody was an expert in IT, they would do an IT lesson and you would do one of their lessons and that wasn't going to happen. And I said, I can't teach music. I really think I would probably make children go backwards with music. <laughs> uh, anyway, I just thought I'm getting out and I did hand in my notice and applied to become a postman. After, after you're, you've been a teacher for, for 13 years. Uh -huh. and postman? Yeah. Like these nice red boxes or... Yep. Uh -huh. And I thought, well, it should be hopefully a bit stress-free and I can... I just wanted to do something different. Uh -huh. At the same time, I was um, sorting out my brother's flat and, and getting it ready for sale. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. I, I applied to become a postman. I got a part-time starting and then eventually full-time. Mm -hmm. And I did that for three years. And it was a good experience. In, in what sense? Well, in many ways, it was totally the opposite of teaching. You know, when you went into the job, you just did the job and you left it and you didn't have to think about it or, or uh, you know, in the evening, you didn't think about it at all. So it's like this nine to five sort of. Yeah, except it was more uh, six to 12 or two, depending. <laughs> okay, yeah. But it was earlier in the morning and I, I, but I really enjoyed it for a few years. Mm -hmm. uh, it was good. I got out on the bike a lot. I met a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you were actually biking and like, you know, throwing these, you know, letters to mailboxes or how was No, it? I was actually delivering them properly. No throwing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was, it was interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, a couple of times I had to deliver. I had to deliver two, two personal, two special deliveries from the Queen. One to somebody who'd reached a hundred, uh -huh. and one to a couple who had been married for seventy years. So that was two things I did from that. How 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 was it? I mean, like, what, how did you deliver it? Like the person who turned one hundred. Well, it's a it's a special delivery, which means it has to be signed for. And then you actually also have to ring up to say you've actually delivered it and uh -huh. it's gone through. Um, uh, the person who was 100, well, they obviously didn't come to the door. Uh -huh. Luckily, their, um, I guess it was their grandson or son came to the door and said, uh, you can understand she's a little bit, she has a little bit of dementia, so she can't sign. And, but this is, you know, this is the address and mm -hmm. we're delighted that she's got this. And so I did that. And then the couple who were married for 70 years, I think, I think one of them came to the door and was able to sign and seemed pretty cheerful. And what was in this, um, in those, um, you know, letters or do, do you know? Not really, because I never actually got to open them. Uh. <laughs> Being special <laughs> delivery, they're not for me to, to uh -huh. open with, but I mean, they used to get telegrams before. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just something that the post office do. It's one of those options. And I did that for three years. It was good. I got a lot of meet of different people. I got to see a different perspective on life. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I kind of got the idea, okay, I think I need to move on in life and, and do something else. Uh, I've, I've mourned my brother for a couple of years and I don't think Jersey's really got anything left for me. My, one of my best friends, he was feeling the same and he migrated to New Zealand. Oh. And uh, I just thought, well, I'm married to Finn, let's try Finland. You said that you got some different perspective. Yeah. What what different perspective? What was it, and in what way it was different? Um, well, you uh, it, it, teaching is very much a, a very caring profession, and it's just with post, it's more like speed. Things have mm -hmm. to be delivered, and you 
have to do things fast and mm -hmm. efficiently. It's a bit less personal, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes, you know, I mean, I, one morning I smelt some gas and I put a note through this person's letterbox saying, uh, I think there's a bit of a smell of gas here. And, you know, the next day he left some money and said, thank you very much, there was gas. And, you know, the gas board came around and, and fixed it. Mm -hmm. And um, I, one morning I had a, a delivery for this door and I was standing there pressing the button and I thought, come on, it's not that big, you're flat. And this young woman came to the door and then she then told me a bit of her life story and then that made me kind of shocked and empathetic. She was only 28, but she'd had a major stroke. Stroke? Yeah, that's why she took a long time to get to the door. She said, at least you've waited. She said, sometimes the postman just can't wait and they just put a, a, no. a message to the yeah. door, but you waited and, and uh, she was, you know, she was a, a young mother and she'd had a serious stroke and I thought, wow, that's kind of, you know, you, you see things from a different point of view when you meet mm -hmm. people who've got different situations in life. You do not expect usually, right, these people? That, no. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was three years, but I say then after that it was time to, time to move to Finland. How did you marry a Finnish woman? Um, well, that's a good story. My friend, Eric, who's, um, he was a, a journalist for a long time. He did a lot of traveling on interrailing when he was 18. And he was in Hungary when he met this Finnish girl who was, in, and they got on well. And she said, why don't you come to Finland sometime? So he did. In the meantime, this girl had met my future wife because she was studying to be a nurse as well. And he said, well, you know, I, I had a great time there. Why don't you come to Jersey? Uh -huh. And at the same time, he said to me, he said, listen, you're not working because of, I was still recovering from my neck operation. Mm -hmm. He said, I know you like cooking. Why don't you take my credit card and get some food and cook and you can meet some new people? Uh -huh. So I said, OK, nothing else to do nothing to lose and uh, they came around in February the 23rd, 1990. 1990. Uh -huh. And uh, I was cooking food. Incidentally, it was, it was a Russian, two Russian dishes. One was um, a steamed, cold steamed cauliflower with mayonnaise and mustard okay. and parsley, I think. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then it was, then it was beef stroganoff. Uh, Finished finally with crepe Suzette, which is French, which um, quite quite a filling meal. Anyway, mm -hmm. she liked the food. Mm -hmm. I liked her, and then she was over in Jersey for ten days, and we kind of met up a few times, and then decided we needed to meet up again. Mm -hmm. So we had lots of phone calls, lots mm -hmm. of long letters. In 1990. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then when we did decide to get married, because I we got engaged to that Christmas. It was quite interesting because that time Finland wasn't in the EU. She had to go through quite a lot of processes to get married. The same here, I had to go be interviewed by the customs, I think it was, and they wanted to check bank statements and phone call records. And Finnish customs. Oh, well, Jersey and Finnish, they both were checking things. And then or immigration, sorry, it was immigration board. And then she had, she had to go to see the ambassador in Helsinki before she got married. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it's funny because a couple of years later, when Finland did join the EU, then I got a letter from the immigration said, oh, the rest of the, you know, all, all the family can come over, they want to now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that was, we got, we met in 1990 and we're married in 1992 mm -hmm. and are still together now very happily. So, and then when you moved? Uh, it was you, you both lived in Jersey, Jersey because mm -hmm. her English is excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, she's, you know, she was a, she was a linguist, but she's a, but she wasn't. She is a nurse mm -hmm. by profession, and it was 2007. Kind of made the decision. I was sitting in, in her sister's cottage one day, in the middle of November, and I just had one of those moments you sometimes get in life. You don't get many, but they're revelations. And I just thought. Why am I just sitting here? Why don't I, why don't I live here? You know, surely I can get a job over here mm -hmm. doing something. I don't mind anything, whether it's stacking shelves, anything. I, would, I think I could start a new life here. And uh, when I told Anita on the bus the next day, or going back to Helsinki, she said, wow, huh? you're really serious. And I said, yeah. And um, we sold our house within two months, lived with my parents until we moved in June. I 
had an interesting experience of sailing to Finland. Sailing? Yeah, mm -hmm. because we had a... After my brother died, I inherited some money off him, and I got this little sailing boat mm -hmm. in his memory, which we called Uncle Pizza. Uncle Pizza? Yeah, because <laughs> my son Anton, who was 26 now nearly, but then he was only seven, and he, he couldn't say Uncle Peter very well, so he called him <laughs> Uncle Pizza. Uh -huh. So we caught the boat in his memory, and uh, I thought, we can't leave this here. We looked at the options of getting it to Finland, and the least expensive and the most interesting one was to hire two people, delivery skipper and crew member, and the three of us brought the boat over, sailing in June 2007. So you sailed, actually, from... Jersey, yeah. <laughs> and arrived in Perinen two and a half weeks later. We left in fog and arrived in fog. Uh -huh. It was an amazing trip. The only bad point was uh, I, in Stockholm, I fell down the hatchway. I was really, really tired and I broke my rib. Uh -huh. But there was nothing you could do about it. So I just took some painkillers and six weeks later it got better. Mm -hmm. And then we started, we bought a house uh, in Perinen and we've been there ever since. Uh, in Perinen, yeah. since 2007. Yeah. You mentioned that your son's name is Anton. Did you name him after...? Well, there's mixed connections there because in Anita's family there are Antons and uh, in my, my father's Antony, but mm -hmm. also I was a big Anster, I'm a big fan of Anton Chekhov. Mm -hmm. So I managed to get that in somehow. <laughs> What's your favourite? Um, I like some of his short stories probably the best, and it varies from kind of what mood I'm in. Mm -hmm. um, I like a dreary story or a boring story. That's quite a that's a bit depressing though. I mean, they're all slightly depressing, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> but I thought he was being honest. Mm -hmm. um, I like the mez mezzanine. I think it's called or yeah, an yeah, artist yeah. story. House with the mezzanine. Yeah, house with the mezzanine. Um, I like, well, I just like most of his stories. Mm -hmm. I think they, he told life as he saw it very honestly. Yeah. Um, and he, you know, I, I have a long list of Russian writers I've read and enjoyed. Can you announce it? Yes, of course. I mean, so I've, number one will be Chekhov. It's difficult to say. It varies again. I mean, I, okay. I go through stages depending on what kind of mood I'm in. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think at the moment it might be Turgenev. Uh -huh. Or have, have I pronounce him? Turgenev. Yeah. yeah. Um, I like his prose, probably. Not too long? No. He's, whereas, I mean, I've read, I, I have and still do have a huge respect for Tolstoy. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he, his stories, like War and Peace, and obviously Anna Karenna before he had his stroke word conversion and changed his viewpoint in life, they're good. But I also like some of his short stories as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Dostoevsky, mm -hmm. and I was pleased to go and see his flat last year in St. Petersburg. Uh -huh. I had to see where he was, feverishly writing away, mm -hmm. trying to, to write quick enough to pay off his gambling debts. With, uh, with his future would-be wife. Yeah. Uh -huh. And they're, I mean, they're all larger-than-life characters, the Russian writers. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tol uh, Chekhov was a doctor, and he refused to recognize he was t had tuberculosis. Did he refuse or... Well, I don't think he took much notice of it until it was too late. Mm. You if, if, you, if, you compare, if you compare Russian literature to English literature... Okay. What, what, what are the differences? Uh, well, it's, a, it's difficult to say, especially with well, the 19th century Russia, there was, a, there was a lot of similarities. I mean, Tolstoy respected Dickens a lot, and I think he may have met him in London mm -hmm. once. And they do have many similarities, uh, but I think in Russian literature there's always a massive philosophical line. Mm -hmm. What are we here for? Mm -hmm. Whereas I think Dickens, he, he explores writing and Trollope explores writing, they look at themes, but it's not always, it doesn't go to that sort of super high level of why we're we here, what, what's the mini meaning of life, mm -hmm. which the Russian writers do. Yeah. What's the meaning of life, Greg? <laughs> I wish I could tell you. <laughs> I'm still trying to work it out. I could have quickly said 42, uh, which is a throwaway line, of course, from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And 
But I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think, I, it's funny, right now I'm reading Sophie's World. Sophie's World. Yeah, uh -huh. which is all about uh, trying to find, it's, it's a sort of a history explained to this 15-year-old girl by this person mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. history of philosophy. Mm -hmm. And again, it's trying to see you know, how different people have over the years have tried to find the meaning of life and from different perspectives. And I have to read it again because it's, it's, it's quite a lot to take in. Yeah. But I mean, well, I suppose the meaning of life in many ways is to be loved, find love and, 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 and do something good in your life. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Okay, yeah, in, in what sense are there, like, you know, they differ, for instance, this Russian literature and English. Because I think also that Russian literature is something that 19th century Russia, uh, maybe one of the main things in 19th century Russia is Russian literature. I think also because Russian literature generally challenged authority. I mean, a lot of them were in trouble, if you look at uh, Pushkin, he got internal exile, didn't he? And then Turgenev, he chose to live outside of Russia a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. He was under pressure at times. Tolstoy was excommunicated. Uh, yeah, by the church. Yeah. yeah. And I think... But Dostoevsky actually, in, the, in his later years, he was very pro-authority. Yes, very that's interesting. Very monarchistic, very... And that's very strange, considering mm -hmm. he, he was put up against a firing squad. Oh, yeah, exactly. And had the ultimate... Whoops, we're not going to do it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to just send you to Siberia for a short time, but... And one uh, of his actual comrades there, he, I think, got mad for yeah. good. I mean, like, that, that was... I can understand that. I mean... Super stressful. You know, you... Contemplating that minute of, of... Or those seconds before of life and death, and then somebody says, it's not happening now. Yeah. And that actually he did explore in his book, the, well, the English translation is called The Idiot. Idiot. It is yeah. a Russian idiot. Which is about a prince who's got epilepsy. Yeah. Mishkin. Yes. So I think, yeah, that, that's the difference. I think Russian, it goes into a much deeper level. Mm -hmm. There's a very psychological level, which again, Dostoevsky explored in, in uh, Crime and Punishment, the psychology of this mm -hmm. student who probably had would be given some sort of maybe mental status now for what his crime was. I mean, the way he was at the time, he'd been ill. Mm -hmm. And it was a cat and mouse game mm -hmm. with, with the Both. student and the police inspector. Yeah. Which, I think there's less humour. <laughs> maybe there's more humour in English, some English literature. Well, but certainly there wasn't mm -hmm. in certain of Dickens' things. But there's a much deeper level of finding the meaning of life. And I say that goes with, with uh, Chekhov as well. Mm. Do, do you think that there is humor at all in Russian literature of the 19th century? Yes, I think there is. Uh -huh. um, and I think it, it's just a bit different. Um, and I think, you know, every country's got its own sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And I think British humour is, well, obviously I know that more because I've mm -hmm. grown up with this and it has shaped my life somewhat. Uh -huh. You know, I, I think it's really important tool in, particularly in teaching. What is British humour? I think it's laughing at yourself a lot mm -hmm. and not taking anything too seriously. Um, you know, I think one of my favourite series is, is The Ripping Yarns, which was a, a sort of spin-off, mm -hmm. offshoot of, of Monty Python because it had... Uh, Terry Jones and um, Michael Palin in, mm -hmm. and they did these sort of spoof history stories, mm -hmm. uh, and it it was so well acted. It just it, I just can't stop laughing. Even now, they are still probably my favourite series. Mm -hmm. They just made fun of so many silly things that happened. Are there sketches in Monty Python that you do not laugh at? Yes. I, I, I don't ask me them because I can't remember them. Uh -huh. I, I, I found Monty Python was a lot of hit and miss. Some things, <laughs> some things could be funny. Other things I just thought, uh, okay, well, that one, you know, maybe we could have left that one out. Mm -hmm. Whereas with Ripping Yarns, I find that it's, it's half an hour of a great story. And mm -hmm. 
there's a lot of clever histor history in it as well. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, Tompkinson School Days, which is mm -hmm. all about a schoolboy called Tompkinson in the 19th century. He goes to this typical boarding school for boys where the school bully is kind of celebrated. He's a, he's a celebrity. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, you can, and the, there's the stupid things like there's a, a, a certain saint's day where students are, get nailed to the wall and things like that. And they have all these stupid, weird traditions, which mm -hmm. a lot of schools do have. Mm -hmm. And it just makes fun of them. But actually, if you look at the character of Tompkinson, he was not allowed to go home in the holidays and his mother was always with strange gentlemen. And I think it's based on Winston Churchill. Uh -huh. Because Winston Churchill had a very unhappy childhood. His father died uh, of syphilis and his mother, getting revenge, basically had a lot of lovers and he wasn't allowed at home in the holidays. So he had a very miserable child. And I think that character is based on him. And I, I think these comedies are very clever in that way. But they just laugh at ourselves. And I think it's good we have to laugh at ourselves. Winston Churchill yeah. had bad childhood. Yes. Charles Dickens had bad childhood. Yes. Dostoevsky did. Yes. Have, and Chekhov, actually. Uh, can it, you know, is there any cause and effect that people who have bad childhood, they actually achieve more than those who had good childhood? Well, I don't know the statistics, but I would imagine some of them, some children who obviously have bad childhoods, it does affect them and then they never really get a chance in life mm -hmm. and sink for it. But there, there are some who would definitely rise above it mm -hmm. and they somehow use it, their bad experiences, as a learning point, a strength character, it makes mm -hmm. their characters better and stronger and they, they can see the, maybe they're, they're more motivated mm -hmm. um, because if you have a comfortable, happy childhood, which I certainly did, I would say I had an idyllic childhood, I wasn't, very, I wasn't ambitious in any way. Because that, that's where I'm like, you know, very interested in your huge experience as a teacher. Uh, we had one, uh, one person here from Romania and she said, and I quote her because what she said, it's very popular among like, people who come out of Finland to Finland. She said that Finnish education system doesn't uh, prepare people for life, doesn't prepare children for life because everybody is equal, there is no competitiveness, uh, and no competitiveness means no ambition. What, what can you tell about that? Is it so? Because I think that people here, children here, have a happy childhood. I'm yeah. sure the absolute majority in Finland children have a happy childhood. Plentiful, uh, lots, of, lots of everything. Uh, what do you think? Is it, is it all, all goods? Uh, this is interesting. It could be. I mean, I think also the, the way the Finnish government works and, and society is that maybe there isn't a huge amount of ambition uh, because people are well cared for. And if you are becoming more successful, you get progressively taxed more. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I don't know. I haven't got. I haven't got a. I'm not a, a government minister. I'm not a, mm -hmm. an expert. But it, it's difficult to say because I think some people, obviously, with international school, people have a different variety of backgrounds, so they're not all Finnish children. Mm -hmm. um, but I do notice that some, maybe, who, some who come from different backgrounds are more motivated. You know, they will take their homework very seriously, mm -hmm. and they will take every project very seriously and, and go beyond what you ask them for. Mm -hmm. Whereas some people, they'll just do what's asked for and no more. Mm -hmm. Being prepared for real life, it's difficult to say because, you know, I, I didn't actually grow up in Finnish society. I just see, on, I live on the fringe of it in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, in some ways, they certainly are prepared. I mean, they Finnish children compared to British school children, are allowed to take a lot more risks. Finnish children yeah, I mean, they, take you know, more risks. They are, it, you know, that we, for example, in Britain, if you do anything at school that has any element of danger, you have to get a letter of permission for it, and it's stifling. For instance, what can it be? 
Well, you know, if you wanted to do any different sporting activity, you would need to get a letter of permission saying we're going to do this today or, you know, we ask your permission, can we do this? And basically you have to make sure that you are covered in case of any accident or anything. Whereas in Finland, you just say, right, we're going to the forest, that's it. You know, I just say to the parents, we're going to do orienteering for the next three weeks. Mm -hmm. We are going to the forest. Your child may bring along their phone then because they can call me if they get lost. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, you know, certainly with the tools they use in the woodworking, metalworking department, they, you know, a lot of English stu teachers, student teachers have said, but they're using that. Mm -hmm. And they're doing it by themselves. Mm -hmm. And I... You know, I think that's one, one area they do. They, they walk to school by themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, in Britain, it's, uh, and certainly in Jersey, it's endemic. People can't, they, oh, it's too dangerous to go, you know, you've got to be given a lift in a car. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the children often have to go home and look after themselves for a few hours. They seem to be able to do that. But maybe they're not geared up towards competitive businesses. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Obviously, some are, um, but and that's the Finnish society. I like it. It's, mm -hmm. it's a fairer society than British society, mm -hmm. and certainly than the Jersey one I, I come from, mm -hmm. and I, I give it respect for that. No, no society is perfect, though. <laughs> but in what sense, in what sense, like Finnish society is more, you know, just or? Well, it's straight away where you're born in England and what you do. I mean, in England there are people who, well, as soon as they're born, or their names are put down to go to certain schools. Mm -hmm. And these schools are elite schools. You have small classes, you pay huge fees. And it's, somebody said, you know, isn't it strange, the last few prime ministers have all gone to Eton. Uh -huh. uh, which is one of the most famous public schools. Mm -hmm. So it's, People have got a difference from the word go. If you live in poorer housing, then often your health suffers. Mm -hmm. And again, if you are coming from a poorer neighborhood, often your diet's maybe poorer. As mm -hmm. a kind of, it's kind of a scary story, but I remember read, hearing on the radio about in England, in the East End of London, when uh, children grew up, when they were, I think it was the 18th birthday, or even the 21st, parents often paid for them to have their teeth removed and have dentures made. Oh, because, because in the East End of London, they, they had a hard life, a poor life, and they basically ate huge amounts of jam on bread. So oh. they, you might as well get your teeth out before they hurt and get your dentures in straight away. I mean, really, like, you know, to, to, to pull out teeth, so that they do not get spoiled and... Yeah, that was, that's what, I mean, that's what I remember hearing on the radio when I was younger, when I was, had my year out and I just thought, wow. So, you know, if you're in a society where you are, from the word go, everything is against you, it's harder to, to move up. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you might be a lot more motivated mm -hmm. and if you've got the ability and luck, then you can succeed. Mm -hmm. What, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm much more under, under impression of Charles Dickens, for instance. Yeah. yeah? And, the, and he had hard childhood, and it got reflected in David Copperfield and Oliver Twist, these workhouses where children worked. What happened that you do not have in Britain these workhouses any longer? I think they finally got banned in 1929. Uh -huh. um, well, I think, obviously, politics slowly changed in Britain. You had the advent of the Labour Party and socialism and during the 20s, 30s and 40s things mm -hmm. changed. I mean Winston Churchill lost straight after the Second World War yeah. the election and the Labour government brought in the National Health Trust mm -hmm. which uh, again uh, some evidence I heard that when people went there first of all some people didn't want to go because they didn't believe in going to doctors and then some people went there and just said can I have some anodin uh, I don't. I haven't got a headache, but I might get a headache because <laughs> uh -huh. I didn't know how to react to it. Mm -hmm. You know, they weren't used to having free medical treatment. Mm -hmm. um, so that was. That's. I mean, things changed, mm -hmm. 
Um, and they had social reformers who wanted to make things better, but it's, it's very difficult to, to make a society equal, mm -hmm. especially if it's an old society where it's been used to things way from, you know, from feudal times in Britain. Mm -hmm. I think my history lecture was basically saying under Anglo-Saxon Britain there was more freedom when it became... Before even, Normans. Yep. So it's like 10th century. Yep. But and after 11th. the Normans, things yeah. tightened up and uh -huh. you had the feudal system officially coming in and life got harder. You said that Labour Party in 1929, this, you know, changing. Do you think that Russian Revolution of 1917 affected this? So that actually it made waves all over the world, which sort of maybe made capitalists be more humanistic or like... That's a good question. I think... Obviously it did cause ripples. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a lot of fear about communism spreading and mm -hmm. some enlightened people think well you know the best thing to do is to steal their thunder take <laughs> some of their ideas and mm -hmm. say they're our ideas mm -hmm. and I think that's always what the case it is you know is if you've got anybody in Britain you know if you've got somebody saying well we're going to introduce this then somebody else will maybe jump on the bandwagon and mm -hmm. you know I was just looking this morning at a National Geographic magazine an article with uh, Nespresso you know, the little cups of coffee, right. mm -hmm. and they were saying how they're helping all these farmers in Africa now and mm -hmm. making sure they're getting better pay and education so they can mm -hmm. grow better crops. Mm -hmm. um, again, you know, you think you're a company which isn't normally known for being philanthropic, but you've maybe got to go with the times and, and become greener and be seen as more mm -hmm. fair and just in this world. Mm -hmm. Modern narratives effect. Yeah, but I'm sure the Russian Revolution did have a massive effect. Mm -hmm. it, it must have done it. Mm -hmm. It caused shockwaves around the world, and um, for better and for worse. Yeah, uh, of course we we are not. I mean, we'll be trying not to talk about politics. But uh, you said about Labour Party and this National Health Trust, right? Uh, was Margaret Thatcher effective, or like how to how like how your your opinion about this figure that is absolutely a historical figure for that will remain for ages? I think. Well, that's history. a good question again because mm -hmm. she was definitely there when I remember coming into power mm -hmm. and being in power, and I would say unfortunately our, our household had the like most households had a right-wing newspaper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I had plenty of that to feed on. Mm -hmm. There were good and bad points, I suppose. I mean, it, I, I would really need to study very hard. I mean, in ethics, for example, when mm -hmm. I teach ethics, we talk about human rights. And there's, for example, all about the right to have unions and, and mm -hmm. strikes and things. And I give example of the, the minor strike. And... I say it's very difficult. I can't even really understand it now properly who was really right because it was a massive struggle mm -hmm. pitted against two groups of people mm -hmm. and it divided the country. Mm -hmm. um, Margaret Thatcher really did get the country to, you know, you're either with the strike or against the strike and mm -hmm. it was a very unhappy time in Britain. Mm -hmm. Very, very unhappy. But it had been following up after years of, of problems. Again, I, when I was a bit younger, I remember the Edward Heath government where there were three-day weeks and electricity being shut out and uh, things like television switching off at 10 o'clock at night and things like that. There was a lot of industrial unhappiness. Mm -hmm. And how much can you blame one person or one party? You know, Britain was undergoing tremendous change at that time, they slowly re began to realise actually like other countries in Europe that it was better to move to building quality rather than quantity because they could mm -hmm. never compete against other countries that were building many things much cheaper. Mm -hmm. So 
Margaret Thatcher is one of those ones I don't want to walk down the track because I don't know enough about it. I just know that some, for certain people, some of my friends admire her mm -hmm. and some loathe her. Mm -hmm. And they all have their own reasons. Mm -hmm. But I, I couldn't have ruled like that. It's okay. not my nature. I couldn't have been that harsh and mm -hmm. draconian, I suppose, mm -hmm. in dealing with things. So maybe I would have been a failure like Edward Heath. I don't know if I'd been a, 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 a prime minister. Yeah. Because, because in, in, um, in Russia, it's, um, in, among many people, it's pretty fashionable to uh, blame Gorbachev for everything that happened uh, mm. with the Soviet Union and with the collapse of the Soviet Union. And uh, one of the narratives is that uh, in these 80s, the situation was so that we had, or Soviet Union had a weak leader, and UK had a strong leader, and US had Reagan, Ronald mm. Reagan, who was also strong, sort of, and Gorbachev couldn't keep up with them, and so he, he lost the country and destroyed and everything. But, I mean, like, that's... Well, people in the West liked Gorbachev. Why? Um, because he was seen as totally different, and he was mm -hmm. seen as, I think we saw him as honestly wanting to reform. Mm -hmm. He realized that the Soviet Union couldn't carry on being the way it was. There was a lot of inefficiency and people were, I mean, I think you can understand, you, you don't really want to see all your own money going towards just purely military. Mm -hmm. You know, people have True. to be able to live. And again, you know, Stalin had re industrialized the Soviet Union, but it, it needed upgrading again, mm -hmm. and moving to, to new technologies and mm -hmm. things. So I know that, again, it was shown on the, on the news that it was, there were, the press were very sympathetic to Gorbachev and mm -hmm. were sad when he left. Mm -hmm. Was he followed immediately by Yeltsin? I already can't remember. Yeah, he, yeah. he was followed immediately, yeah. End of 1991 and in 1992 yeah. it was already. But how, like, you were, when Soviet Union collapsed, you were 27. Yeah, 1991, you were 27. Yeah. And when Gorbachev actually appeared uh, as a ruler or as a president, not president yet, general secretary, you were 20, 21. Yes. It was 1985. Do, do you remember your... Mm, can you recollect anything? Like you were 20, uh, 21, and that was Soviet Union, and, and then suddenly changes something. Do you remember how you felt towards Soviet Union in... Uh, mid eighties. Yeah, I mean, I, I was I used to read the Independent newspaper as a student, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was, well, I was just hoping for the for the people's sake that things were going to get better, mm -hmm. because I, I just had this impression that the, and I know the Russian writers of the nineteenth century have always felt that the people have always suffered mm -hmm. unnecessarily so, and they're always talking about the condition and things and. I just hope that it would, if, if people's living standards would improve, then maybe international relations would improve as well. Mm -hmm. Because having a cold war was actually pretty scary. You were scared. As a young child, I, for example, I remember we used to have Weetabix. And on the back, they had, it's this breakfast cereal, they had this game. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a free game and it had the red bombers and the blue bombers. Uh -huh. Um, you know, it's just a car, uh, you had to move them around and throw dice and things, but mm -hmm. it's obviously a reference, <laughs> red mm -hmm. and blue. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, you know, the, there was a feeling that things could go wrong. And I remember when the invasion of Afghanistan happened, the news... 1979, I yep, think. The yeah. news went on for two hours. Instead of half an hour, nine o'clock news, mm -hmm. it was two hours. Mm -hmm. And it... At that age, I was a little bit worried. I thought, you know, does this mean it's going to be a catastrophic world war? Uh -huh. It wasn't. But so you actually expected the world war? At I was. I thought it could. Well, it, it, the way it was shown on the news, mm -hmm. it was seen like, oh, it, they did this, so we're going to have to do something back. And I just thought, uh -huh. well, we can't just keep going tit for tat. Mm -hmm. um, but I was, you know, when the Soviet Union collapsed, or well, communism collapsed, it, I think we all breathed a sigh of relief, thinking, well, hopefully it's going to be better relations mm -hmm. uh, between East and West. And 
again, I think we will hope to be better relations with China when mm -hmm. they started relaxing and becoming more capitalistic. Mm -hmm. There seems to be more of a crackdown there now. Mm. So it's a bit, a, bit of a bit of a shame because on a human level, mm. we can all get on well, but it just seems on national level we're not so good at doing it. Why? Uh, maybe because we put I, I nationalism really, first. Maybe because we put nationalism first, and I think, was it Thomas Paine who said, or, or somebody said, I'm not a citizen of the country, I'm a citizen of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, if we try and think more on a, a world basis rather than just a country basis, mm -hmm. then maybe we can get on better. What, what prevents us? Who prevents us? Who, who is like, you know, who is the perpetrator of... Well, vested interests, obviously. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've... You know, I was li li listening to a little biography about Charles Cha Charlie Chapman this week, and mm -hmm. you know when the big anti-communist witch hunt went on in, in Hollywood. But he was a communist, I think, right? He did have an interest in it because he had yeah. a very depressing childhood as well. <laughs> uh -huh. um, um, but again, sometimes some of these communists didn't know really quite mm -hmm. what conditions were like. Mm -hmm. You know, they were communi idealist communists rather than real ones. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had, it, it takes people with courage like uh, it, Muhammad Ali, for example, to say, well, I, I have nothing against a North Vietnamese farmer. Why am I going to go and fight him? Mm -hmm. You know, is he really that political? You know, and he, he mm -hmm. got jailed, lost his world title. Muhammad. Yeah, because he refused to be drafted in the army mm -hmm. and said, I have no, no reason to fight them. I, I, I'm not going to. Uh, and if people in power don't like that when people actually question and refuse things. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe if more people did that, then we would be able to step back from... Anarchy. Yes, well... <laughs> <laughs> we can't all be anarchists, unfortunately, either. <laughs> it's difficult solving world problems. Exactly, exactly. But it's nice yeah. sitting down and having a cup of tea to do it. <laughs> yeah, okay. If we return, if we return to 2007, you mm. appeared in Finland, yep. in Parainen. Yes. What do you do first? Uh, have a takeaway pizza and a beer and fall asleep. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, uh, beyond that, well then I, I'd actually contacted Vesta Valkula in March because we wanted oh. our son to come to the school here. Uh -huh. The school already existed in 2007. Yes, it had been going for an... Was it, I think they celebrated their fifth anniversary around there. Was it that oh, nor the next, next spring? Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know, any chance of a job? I said, I, I just immediately got a good vibe when I walked around the school. Mm -hmm. I just thought, this school, it's none like my last one. And I, I immediately um, felt connected to mm -hmm. Mr. Valkler as well. I, he, he likes sailing. Uh -huh. He likes skiing and we have many things in common and I just thought I'd like to be part of this if I get a chance. Mm -hmm. So I asked for a job and he said, well, there might be one possibly coming up. You know, we, there wasn't at the time, but luckily just before this term started, they needed a new teacher because they had more students coming in. Mm -hmm. And they needed to split the combined fifth and sixth grade and make them first time as separate classes. Mm -hmm. So I got the fifth grade. And the rest is history. <laughs> I was actually meant to go on a Finnish course to learn Finnish mm -hmm. and to reintegrate into society. That's why I was laughing when she read that. Um, and then she had to ring them up and say, sorry, but he's actually going to start work. So mm -hmm. um, I never went on the course. Have you integrated into the society? Well, I haven't learned Finnish and I, my wife and son say I'm lazy on that score. And possibly I am. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say with integrating Finnish society, I hope so, I think so. I, I mix with my neighbours mm -hmm. um, and I've tried to, to learn how to be Finnish in, in many ways as possible. For instance, well, Finnish, how to be Finnish? Well, I think um, if you Finnish, well, when I walk around my neighbourhood, I see a lot of Finnish, usually men, but it's not always men, but there's a lot of work on their houses by themselves. Mm -hmm. And I'm not used to that. I mean, in Britain you do a bit of DIY, but you normally get in trades people. Mm -hmm. And um, I just thought, well, I've, I've got to learn how to do these things. Mm -hmm. And I just walk around 
taking the dog. It's spying, really. Industri <laughs> industrial espionage. I go around and I, I look. Oh, yeah, that's what they do. And I watch people do jobs and I mm -hmm. try and learn from them. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, they don't hire scaffolding. They just build it themselves out of wood. Mm -hmm. And I thought, and I thought that's really good because you, you don't have to have a level f ground. And I thought, this year I'm painting my last wall of the house, a stone mm -hmm. wall. It takes age to paint. I need to build a scaffolding. Mm -hmm. And I, I watched other people, took a few photographs, and then got some wood and built it. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and then painted the wall. And I thought, well, that's a little start. And mm -hmm. just, we, no, my wife is Finnish, and we have some Finnish family. Mm -hmm. and, and just mixing with, with Finns and, and kind of slowly thinking along their wavelengths. Mm -hmm. um, what does it mean? Well, there are just little certain things that are, you know, finished customs. I mean, I kind of like, in, in for example, in the school, things are very laid back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, every year you get the cap giving ceremony. And it's just very laid back. The people just, you're told it's 10 o'clock, you just roll, roll out, and then they mm -hmm. have the, the speech and things. And I think it's a lot more informal in Finland. Mm -hmm. And I, I like that. Mm -hmm. What else? Finnish. Finnishness. Uh, well, I, I mean, I guess you could apply this to Russians as well. I mean, I love the sauna now and I've... Sauna? Yep, oh. I've learnt to roll in the snow and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I even had an ice, ice swim without, uh -huh. without a sauna. I just... Uh -huh. I was convinced to have a go. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I enjoyed it and I thought, this is really good. You know, mm -hmm. outwardly you think, people are mad, why would we go on ice? Mm -hmm. It can't be... isn't it dangerous? But actually, after I felt a tremendous sense of well-being. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, you just sometimes have to try new things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm glad I did. And I, I, I'm, you know, I'm happy to have, have cold showers every day. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'll go in the ice again. Yeah. And again, the Finns, I mean, I love the way when they go sailing in the summer, they bring along the pets. Mm -hmm. I mean, we take our dog now, which we couldn't have done in Jersey. You, there's always forbidden pets because there's the threat of rabies coming from France. Uh -huh. I mean, I've seen Finns taking around dogs, uh, tortoises. Tortoises? Yeah, cats. Uh -huh. On a boat? Yeah, I mean, a couple of summers ago, uh, the, one of the favourite pictures I took and I put on my screen save, which the class loved, was this huge Norwegian forest cat <laughs> guarding this boat. Mm -hmm. It was massive and it was just sitting on the front deck and even my dog was kind of scuttling by, slowly kind of thinking, that is a big cat, I'm not picking a fight with that one. <laughs> yeah. Still Uncle Pizza? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, Uncle Pizza is, loves sailing up here because mm -hmm. it's, I mean, that's, it's great. You've got no tides, mm -hmm. which are always the problem back mm -hmm. at home. You had to plan everything around the tides. Yeah. And you've got lots of islands to go to or places to anchor. So, what is the best thing in sailing? Um, I think it's, well, it depends. If you ask my wife, she says, getting there. Yeah, okay. uh -huh. She likes actually arriving somewhere and then, mm -hmm. you know, setting up camp on the boat and exploring. I think about sailing, if you actually sail, you know, pure sailing, it's just the fact that it's you and nature. Mm -hmm. You are using some metal poles and some material mm -hmm. and some ropes to, mm -hmm get your boat to move um, even against the wind mm -hmm. obviously you have to zigzag when you're tacking but it it's a, a skill and the, the just judging how much wind sail to put up against the wind conditions and yeah. you feel like you've accomplished something and it, it's very very relaxing mm -hmm. you can feel your heart pulse going yeah. down and the sea around yeah, yeah. It, and the wind you just hear the sound of the water sloshing against mm -hmm. the hull and you think, yeah, this is, this is a relaxation. Is there any, any similarity between sailing and teaching? Oh, that's a good one. A <laughs> metaphor time almost. <laughs> well, this is a metaphor I, or simile I always use when I have my new class. I always say it's, it, we are like a big ship like the Viking Gris. I say we are, right now we're in the harbour mm -hmm. and 
I said the first few days, it's basically, it's just like when they chuck the ropes off. The boat is not moving. Mm -hmm. It's just getting it to start. Then I say the next week is like we're just slowly moving out of the harbour. Mm -hmm. And then I say by about five or six weeks, then it's like we're sailing at full speed. Uh -huh. You know, it's because I, I've got to know you, you've got to know me. Uh, we all know our timetables. We, we know what's expected of each other mm -hmm. and we operate more efficiently then. Five, six weeks. I think it takes that time. Well, I mean, some, some children it takes uh, one day, <laughs> they, they're totally on board from the word go, uh, and some it takes longer. Mm -hmm. you, you started spring 2008, right? Um, no, actually I started August, August 2007. August 2007. Yeah. Uh, so it's like 13 years ago. Yes. 13 years ago. If you think about students then and students now, are they different? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I still bump into some old students. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, obviously, we've all got smartphones. Mm -hmm. And some of them are a lot more street savvy and, mm -hmm. and doing things with them. But even then, I mean, when I first started, I, I was unaware of YouTube. <laughs> I'm totally unaware. Mm -hmm. uh, and I knew that they all kept talking about YouTube. And I thought, well, why, why do they do that? Mm -hmm. But now I, you know, I realize myself how useful it is in many ways. Um, I think students basically are the same. Possibly, yeah, well, I would say they're basically the same. There's always going to be a small contingent who are the super fit ones who are doing all the really ultra strenuous sports. Mm -hmm. um, others who are more into middling sports they don't mm -hmm. they do it for fun rather than competitiveness mm -hmm. um attitudes to work maybe that's changed a bit in what um because Wait. everybody expects instant information people now children yep. now expect instant information and to a certain extent so do we uh -huh. you know we grew up expecting to go to a library to find information and, and mm -hmm. so on but now we've all got used to it so some of them are finding certain aspects of work hard to do. They kind of think, why do we have to do this? Mm -hmm. But, you know, so it's no good just saying, well, I found, you know, I said, I'm not interested if you do a presentation and I can see that you've just copied and pasted it. Mm -hmm. I said, even, you know, even the rest of the class will mock them for that. Mm -hmm. They said, oh, why have you left the purple numbers up there? That's from Wikipedia, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that is maybe a problem that maybe in certain cases, Students don't have the same patience mm -hmm. as maybe they had before. Patience. Uh -huh. um, I think some are patient. And maybe, maybe I hark back too long, back to my own childhood where, you know, I needed to be able to study for long hours and be patient about things. But otherwise, there's many, many similarities. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a different world. Children now are, in my opinion, a lot more direct and, and open. When I was at school, I was never have the same relationship with students in now. It was always teachers were very distant figures, mm -hmm. authoritarian figures. W was it was it because it was Great Britain and not Finland? Uh, I don't think so. Because you know, when I speak to my wife, and she said when she was at school, uh -huh. roughly the same time that it was different. Mm -hmm. She says, you know, she's amazed that you know students will, you know send me a, a message over the weekend asking me, you know, am I doing something or just, uh, they will contact me and ask things which she said, well, we would never have dared do that. Yeah. So hierarchy is like flattening sort of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I, it's, an, it's enjoyable. I mean, I, I, at first I was a bit scared thinking, well, you know, if you start letting them do this, then they'll just start walking all over you and, and there'll be no... <laughs> <laughs> It'll be anarchy, but actually, I haven't noticed that really. I think mm -hmm. there is still a healthy level of respect, and um, I very much, I think I've, I enjoy teaching just as much, or mm -hmm. if not more, than I've ever have done. Oh. You know, I think you can talk to students on a one to one basis, very openly, and you know, ask them all sorts of things, and 
They're usually pretty honest. Actually, being pretty honest, I talk to uh, quite a few students, and when I ask them, even here in June, I was interviewing Irina, who was the graduate, and when, not, not only Irina, she was just like confirming. When I ask, who is the best teacher in Turku International School? The answer is invariably Greg Ward. Why? Oh, well, that's very flattering. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not, I, I can't imagine myself as being the best teacher. I, I, and I, I, I have to say I'm not, because mm -hmm. I have great colleagues who do things maybe differently. Mm -hmm. Um, possibly, but apparently you know something because I mean, like that's the first name, Greg Ward. Maybe because I'm part of the woodwork. I've been there for so long, <laughs> <laughs> and I perhaps because I know things. Um, maybe I think possibly one thing that might be is I know that in Britain, when you walk into a classroom, you have to earn a class's respect. Mm -hmm. It's not like I am the teacher and you will do as I say. Mm -hmm. It's okay, we are, you're the students and I'm the teacher and now it's open warfare. We've got to work out mm -hmm. the best way we're going to work together. And um, I think I've hopefully worked out a reasonably successful way of working with students that mm -hmm. they enjoy and I enjoy. You know, I think there's a large measure of trust. I. I Say to me, you know, if you if you work for me, mm -hmm. I will work for you. You know, I will mm -hmm. give you all the help I can. Um, and I will, you know, I'm there to be listened to, mm -hmm. and I do listen to them. Mm -hmm. And I just find that we seem to get on pretty well. Maybe because I'm older and had a kid myself. Mm -hmm. I think that's helped as well. Mm -hmm. And also, maybe they like the sense of humour because so we have a. I can laugh at myself and do, I, mean, I think it's important sometimes mm -hmm. to put you on a kind of similar level to them. So respect, yet still somehow on the similar level, right? So it's, yeah. it's, it's like an art probably, right? It's honesty as well. I mean, I, sometimes I will go to them and say, look, I have no idea how to do this. Mm -hmm. Can you help me? <laughs> they, will, they will show me. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they feel very proud. Oh, I helped the teachers because, you know, I said, you know, I'm older. It's hard for me to learn new things. And, I want to do this with you, but I just can't do it unless somebody shows me how to do certain things. And uh, I think that may be the case. And, you know, uh, maybe it helps when we have things like a school camp as well. They see us on a, even a different level as well as being a teacher. They see mm -hmm. us in an outside of school mm -hmm. capacity as well. Yeah, camps actually also were mentioned that it's, yeah. it's one of the best experiences during the school, these camps in the woods. And I like it and I was amazed because the first year when I was going to do that, I, I remember it was one of the boys in the class, he was like a union rep. Mm -hmm. um, and he was come up to me and said, Mr. Ward, do you know that we're supposed to go to school camp this year? And I said, uh, nope. Uh -huh. Tell me about it then. <laughs> and he said, well, we go to this place and, and I said, all right, I'll go and ask one of the other teachers. Mm -hmm. and." And we got it organized, and it went better than I expected because uh, it was easier as well. The kind of school camps I did in Jersey, we had to get all the food mm -hmm. ourselves and cook it. Mm -hmm. And actually, it was usually one or maybe two teachers and a parent who'd come along and help. And, it, and we were on this little fort mm -hmm. on this little island that got cut off by the tide, and it, we were told you have to have everything meticulously planned because they said this is the only place in the island. If something goes wrong and there were lots of rocks and things to fall around mm -hmm. onto and a tide that rushed in and out, if this place gets shut down, you will not be very popular. Uh -huh. You know, we have to be sure that you know what you're doing and so on. And whereas the, the school camp here was a lot more open and flexible, mm -hmm. didn't have to cook, everything was done for us. Mm -hmm. So it could give more time to just doing things with the class. And maybe they like the drama projects as well. I think that's one thing they've always liked, mm -hmm. drama. Which I think is really important because it, some students are not academic. Mm -hmm. And some of them really shine things like a drama situation. Mm -hmm. And it gives them a chance to show the class, well, actually, I do have skills which you just haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. So I think that's 
possibly a reason we get on well as a teacher in the class. Mm -hmm. What is your attitude towards this change to phenomenon-based learning that I think happened in 2016? It happened and I think it was, a, I think it was an experiment, mm -hmm. but I think we found that it worked well with the students who were mm -hmm. really motivated and cooperated well together, mm -hmm. but it did not work well with the students who were not so organized Mm -hmm. um, so I think basically it started fizzling out because we realized it wasn't really helping the ones who really needed helping. Uh -huh. So you think that it will stop at some point? I think it possibly will. I mean the, the Finnish government is open to, from what I see on the, the, the curriculum, they're open to experimenting with things. Mm -hmm. They want to, to try out new methods of teaching. Mm -hmm and they know that some will work and some won't work mm -hmm. and I think that could be part of the reason it, it, it took a huge amount of organization as well mm -hmm. and it, as I said it just the first time we did it, it was with uh, mixed classes and I ended up being with well some of my old class when I had a fifth grade class and seventh graders but some of them just, they just couldn't, I don't know, we tried to give them points and they just could not seem to be able to think of linking three things together. Mm -hmm. They expected it to be done for them and it was a really hard struggle for some and then others, they just immediately got into it and they, they, they could have, you know, you could possibly have a schooling system mm -hmm. where it could everything be phenomenon based, but then, you know, you might miss out on certain things which are not so exciting to do, but probably very important to do it in schooling. Mm -hmm. You know, learning the tables is not exciting, mm -hmm. but if you know them, then it, it speeds up your mental, mental maths and you know, you won't, you won't forget them. Absolutely. Uh, what, what do you think about uh, handwriting that we don't have it now? Well, I was very worried about that because obviously when, when the iPads came in, uh, I was, Concern, I was thinking, well, yeah, we do have to move in the future. And I know that, for example, we had a visit from the Steiner School, I think it was, mm -hmm. and they don't use anything modern like that. They just, everything written. Mm -hmm. And they had books that were beautiful, but I just thought, it's archaic. Mm -hmm. Would you know, would you really want to be writing on stone? Because that was <laughs> the way of writing once, yeah. or clay tablets. <laughs> you know, people moved to writing because it yeah. was faster and better than those previous yeah. things. And, and paper got cheaper and pens and things got cheaper. It's just the same, you know, my mum used to put ink and ink wells in her class <laughs> and they used dip pens, which I still yeah. love. Yeah. But you have to be realistic and think, you know, we are moving in times where we're using digital media and we have to be able to type. But in, I was pleasantly surprised though, to find that the handwriting has not all turned into a horrible scrawl. Mm -hmm. That was my biggest fear, that all of a sudden we wouldn't write, but some of the students actually prefer writing in certain situations. And some of them actually say, do we have to do it on the iPad? Can't we write this by hand? Mm -hmm. Which is quite interesting. And I think, and I always tell the class that if you write by hand, by actually using the hand and making the gestures of the letters, you remember it mm -hmm. better than just doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I always tell them that I'm always writing lists for shopping and I'm always forgetting the list, but because I've written a list, it's on my head. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of them, I think, do do handwritten notes for certain mm -hmm. things. And I think that's good and they, I think they still appreciate that handwriting has a place. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd hate to see it go. Uh, your son, who is 26, right? Just about. Yeah, yep. just about. Does he feel himself a Finn or a British or what, what is his ident self-identification? That's an interesting one because he's a bit reticent about things, but he, he is, I have to say I admire him immensely because he has, he started with very little finish mm -hmm. and he has worked really, really hard at it. Mm -hmm. He was nervous about doing his army bit. Mm -hmm. 
and the first few weeks he said were miserable because you know it was hard but his finish has picked up mm -hmm. he is torn a bit because his best friends still live in jersey he has one or two friends here how old was he when you he was he started his first and his worst day at school ever was his 13th birthday when he started oh okay mm -hmm. I remember he said, oh, well, it's not fair, but if you were in Jersey, I wouldn't be at school now, I'd be on holiday, and I'd be with my friends, and uh -huh. you'd drag me over here. Mm -hmm. But he has learned to fit in, and I think he, he certainly loves the nature over here. I mean, he, he's very keen on um, physical activity, mm -hmm. sports. He loves trail running mm -hmm. and cycling, and he's picking up on his skiing skills. Mm -hmm and open water swimming as well mm. you know we do those activities together or sometimes he just goes off very long trips by mm. himself and this is what help keeps keeps him in Finland I think mm. and I think he's picking up say all the time on on Finnish mannerisms and things because he understands the language so much better he can understand sort of the Finnish humor mm. and things like that as well so mm -hmm. Well, he is half Finnish, half English. So I think he thinks himself as that. Mm -hmm. Man of the world. Yes. Uh, if you, if you advised to young teachers, you are a father. You have experience yeah. of a father. You are a teacher. You taught in Britain. You taught in Finland. Yeah. You are teaching basically. Yes. Uh, what are the most important things that uh, young teachers should know? And should do well remember first of all that it is a vocation it's not a job uh -huh. you have to be motivated to do it the day I don't want to go to school or think oh no then I will and that's a resignation again mm -hmm. I don't think I should be at school if I'm not prepared to be you know give it my give it my lot it's something you have to believe in mm -hmm. Um, so I would say be sure it's what you want to do mm -hmm. and when you're starting out you know be prepared that things won't always go that easily if you're the new teacher it's mm -hmm. it is daunting starting off being a new teacher mm -hmm. at a school you know a lot of children will be thinking oh this is gonna be the easy one mm -hmm. um, and of course because you're young usually then you're sort of the cool one as well but it's it's a hard start but once if you if you're prepared to work hard mm -hmm. and be flexible be, you know you'll meet children from so many different backgrounds and so many different stories you have to be able to empathize a lot mm -hmm. get into their foot something you know why you know if if that's their background why on earth would they want to come work at school you know something's going on in their life that's they can't mm -hmm. think about school they just something at home is constantly bugging them or whatever you have to, to get into their feet and understand what's going on mm -hmm. and empathize and I think you have to have a kind of certain mindset where you will work slog your guts out for 10 months of the year <laughs> and enjoy enjoy mm -hmm. the two months off in the summer mm -hmm. and that's why I still want to be a teacher I, I enjoy that I love meeting new kids and things and seeing how they develop it's, it's fantastic watching them especially when they get to grade six seeing how they can blossom as writers mm -hmm. you know I'm, I'm innately jealous some of these children I have they're not even English and they're writing beautifully in English mm -hmm. from different backgrounds mm -hmm. different you know it's not their first language and I will never be able to rise to their levels of of writing skills no no I mean really? I can write I can write grammatically I, I can write but I, wouldn't, I can see already the potential, mm -hmm. the way they're writing at 12. Mm -hmm. I can see that they are, they are, their writing is, uh, is, is stunning, some of them. Mm -hmm. it, it literally blows me away when I read some of the things they write. And I think, wow, I wish I could write that. Some of the lines they come up with. Mm -hmm. So um, that's it. If you're going to be a teacher, be prepared to work hard. And you've got to be motivated. You've mm -hmm. got to want to do it. Okay. Uh, about writing, I, we, we discussed about the 19th century and yeah. uh, 
Uh, if we think 20th century, three authors, John Rowling, Agatha Christie, and Ian Fleming. Yeah. What can you tell about them? Not a huge amount, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't read Ian Fleming. Mm -hmm. I'm not a kind of James Bond mm -hmm. fan thing. So, um, Agatha Christie I have read. And if I can basically focus on her, because she's the one I've read the most. Mm -hmm. She's a, she was a, a good writer, mm -hmm. but she certainly wasn't the best detective writer. Who was the best? That's a good question. <laughs> I have, because I'm in the Folio Book Club, mm -hmm. I would recommend that to many people. It's, a, it's hardback books. Mm -hmm. They are beautifully illustrated. Folio. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they're not that gracefully expensive. Mm -hmm. They... I've read several female authors. I would say Dorothy L. Sayers is exceptionally good. Mm -hmm. um, but I also like another one. Um, I'm just trying to think of a name now. It's gone out of my head, unfortunately. But she wrote The Franchise Affair, The Singing Sands, um, and a few others. It's so sad, it's just gone out of my head, her name. But mm -hmm. I really like her writing. Mm -hmm. Um, Brat Farrar, she wrote as well, so somebody might remember who she is. Uh -huh. uh, so, I hope that answers your question, <laughs> possibly. Female author, I really liked. Mm -hmm. Why Harry Potter has become so popular? Well, I think it strikes something with people. People... Of course it does. Yeah, what? so there's what? something... <laughs> well, I suppose people still have got a space for imagination and, mm -hmm. and, and magical things. We're living in a more and more scientific world where magical things are, are being disparaged, mm -hmm. they're not accepted. And it just shows there is still space for people in there. They want to, mm -hmm. to, to read about these sort of things. And she managed to also put together a long series which mm -hmm. kept people motivated. Mm -hmm and going and wanting to know more about the characters. So why not? I mean, it was great. It got a lot of boys reading mm -hmm. who were, had lost interest in reading. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And um, now the Lewis Carroll Blitz. Okay. So why is a raven like a writing desk? That is a difficult question. Again, um, I'm trying to think. Well, a raven has got a sharp beak and on a writing desk you have a sharp nib of a pen. Okay. That's my only thing I can think of that might connect it. Mm -hmm. Where can I find someone normal? Possibly you can't. <laughs> Make up rule 42. Um, uh, take some hallucinogenic drugs before you come to one of Sir Kay's interviews. <laughs> <laughs> then you can answer all the weird questions. <laughs> what makes the world go round? Love. Who in this world are you? I am at the moment a teacher. In my next life, I don't know, a butterfly? <laughs> the best way to explain is... Varies. It varies. Sometimes, sometimes explaining is not to actually stand and show it. Sometimes it's to just let people find out for themselves. Mm -hmm. They have to do it themselves. You can't explain some things to certain people. Mm -hmm. But so leave varies. them alone, probably. Sometimes. Some some people, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. What would happen if everybody minded their own business? It would be a dull world. <laughs> One of the deep secrets of life is? Still to be found. <laughs> what to do if you want to get to a place you want to be? Well, many things. Uh, I sailed. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Greg. Thank you. And thank you for coming and for being such a fantastic teacher. And thank for you. What I, you do. I really appreciate being asked to come along. Uh, I say, I. I'm lucky I work with a bunch of superb teachers. They, we all motivate each other. You know, I really enjoyed being with them. Uh, they've carried me through some tricky times and uh, I have to give my colleagues a lot of respect because a lot of things they help me with because everything's in Finnish and I have to 
get on and do things and they help me in I, many ways. I think that the whole team of uh, Turku International School is fantastic. I agree, thank you. Thank you. And that's all talks for today. Have a great tomorrow. Thank you.